Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of myself and Mark and Alice and everybody at Bible Talk, all of us at Bible Talk, yes. I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in this program, looking for the roots, the reality of what following and serving Jesus Christ is. In Search of Christianity. In Search of Christianity. And the reason that we're in search of Christianity, or the, the, the real, is that we can return to it. Yes. Get back to the roots of our faith, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the purpose in all of this. So we're going to pick up, uh, last week we were talking about, we're in Acts chapter 6, looking at the change, the transition in the church. That was a very transitional period in the, in the church of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. right at its foundation, that had a major impact all the way through to today. And so that's what we're talking about, and we've been talking about that for the last two programs, which are still available online for you to watch if, you, if you've missed any of those. But before we start this evening, I want to ask Mark to ask God's blessing upon our time yes, together. thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can come together to learn from your word and yes. worship you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, we're in awe of your, not only your gentleness and your mercy, but also of your authority and power. Yes, sir. And we just thank you for, for revealing your wisdom to us. Thank you, Amen. 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 All right. Um, before we get into too much in this particular program, I just want to remind you of something that we talked about earlier on in one of our earlier programs. There's somebody said, and I'm not quite sure who, because it's been attributed to a few people, that... Christianity started as a fellowship in Jerusalem, became a philosophy in Greece, became a culture in Rome, and became an enterprise in the West. Now I want you to keep that in mind, right? That after starting as a fellowship in Jerusalem, he said that it became a philosophy in Greece. Okay, just bear that in mind as we go along. All right, we're picking up where we left off and we're in Acts chapter 6, and I'm going to read at verse 3. Therefore, brethren, select from among, your, from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. And they're talking about serving the food. Remember, because a mm -hmm. di dispute had arisen between the Hellenistic Jews and the native Jews. Yes. Right? So now the apostles, they come up with this solution that they're going to they're gonna pick seven people to distribute the food. Mm -hmm. Well, oh my goodness gracious, you know, maybe the apostles were too busy or perhaps too important to deal with the perceived problem, this distribution of food. So they want to turn the task over to a combination of people who, a combination of people in the church who are, first of all, the root cause of the problem. Right. Turn it over to people who are, who are creating this division, or many people who are spiritually, very spiritually immature at this point. Remember, this is the early church, and it, it starts by talking about how so many people were being added to their numbers. Well, as they're being added to their numbers, they're coming in without a great deal of knowledge mm -hmm. about the truth of Jesus Christ. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, and this is why God has appointed the apostles to Overseen. equip. Yeah. Quick. and train yeah. them, right? And the other part of that group is people who should be mature enough to understand that the problem is not the distribution of the food, that the problem was division in the body. As I just said, the apostles were called by the Lord to equip the saints for the work of service. But they should have been the most qualified, the apostles should have been the most qualified to know who among the saints yeah. was of good reputation full of the spirit and of wisdom. Like a pastor. Well, because it says the shepherd should know well the condition of his flock. That's right. And if their job is to, to equip these people by training them, they should know the people, right. and therefore they should know they should right off the bat 
right. who is ready and, and properly appoint you know properly appoint them mm -hmm. and and it should be the job of the apostles to a appoint them if indeed god wants somebody appointed god is into appointing yes. he god the father appointed jesus christ it says in acts 10 right mm -hmm. jesus appointed the apostles god has appointed in the church apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers yes jesus appointed Paul mm -hmm. to be an apostle. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in every church. Paul instructed Titus to appoint elders in every city in Crete. And Paul appointed Timothy and instructed him to entrust other faithful men to these teachings and instructed him on how to appoint elders and deacons. Amen. <clears throat> That's very important. Well, it's very important because there's something as I say, there's a, a transition taking place mm -hmm. here. You, what we see is God's plan that those above, because all authority flows from the top down. Yes. Okay? Now, what's taking place here in Acts chapter 6 is not without precedence in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You see, God had appointed Moses as spokesman to lead his people out of bondage in Egypt. But when the people began to grumble, they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. It says that in Numbers 14.4. Now Moses, perhaps because he was wearying of well-doing, was moved to say to the people of God, and I'm going to read this to you, The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousandfold more than you are, and bless you just as he has promised you. How can I alone bear the load and burden of you and your strife? Choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes, and I will appoint them as your heads. The people answered me and said, The thing which you have said to do is good. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 10 to 14. It's just like here in, in Acts chapter 6. Yes, yes, it sounds almost identical. It is. So it's, it should be important to know, because... Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Mm -hmm. Right after that, in Deuteronomy 1, it says the very next thing we see is that the people of God are rebelling against the command of the Lord your God. Right. So that plan didn't work, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> 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 Structure, good order, is an absolute requirement within the, God, in the church of God, all right? He's not a God of confusion. He's a God of good order. Mm -hmm. But that structure has to come from the head. And Jesus Christ Amen. is the head. So I want to talk a minute about the types of power. All right? The, the worldly, what we know in the world as structures of power. Now, now, I'm not going to talk about types of economic systems. That's like capitalism and socialism and communism. That's, those are economic structures. But power structures, that's the way people... Who has the power? I'm just going to name some. Now, this is, may not necessarily be all, but these are certainly the most pertinent. A theocracy. That's one form of the distribution of power. And by the way, theocracy may sound good to you right off the bat, but one nation here right now that may be causing a little trouble is a declared theocracy, and that's Iran. That's right. So if you're going to have a theocracy, make sure you got the right guy. Okay. A monarchy. A dictatorship. An oligarchy, that's a very few people rule everything. Yes, yeah. A democracy, a republic, which is what the United States actually is, by the way. And the last is anarchy, which means that there's nobody who has the power. It's just, you know, chaos. Mm -hmm. Okay? Got it. Now, I want to preface this by talking about, just for one second, about Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet was the great patriot of his yes. time all right mm -hmm. but he was attacked by his own brothers he was attacked by priests and false prophets he was imprisoned by the king threatened with death and thrown into a cistern by the officials of judah all of this because he was perceived as unpatriotic mm -hmm. all right because he was speaking out against what was going on in israel right. okay I'm going to say something now, and I want you, I, 
I, I hope this makes your hair stand up on edge and makes you tingle a little bit. But before you throw something at me through the screen, I want you to take and think for a second and see if you can prove that this statement is incorrect. Okay. Christianity is very simply a kingdom ruled absolutely by a dictator. Yes. Can you find fault with that statement? No. No. Okay? You can't find fault with that statement because everything that we do is supposed to be guided and led by the Word of God. That's right. What He has spoken. That's what a dictator is. I mean, you're ruled by what He says. Everything in our lives should be ruled by what God has said. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Yes. Okay? Now, when Paul was writing to the church of the Colossians, right? Mm -hmm. He's speaking of Jesus, and he says, and I'm going to read this from Colossians, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Amen. You understand that he said that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ Jesus. They reside in Christ Jesus. Okay. And then he goes on to say, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. That's from the second chapter of Colossians, all right? The last verse was Colossians 2.8. Mm -hmm. Now, bear in mind what I said in the very beginning, right? Christianity went from being a fellowship to being a philosophy. Now, I want to tell you that you cannot separate philosophy from Greece. No. Okay? Right. Greece is the foundation, is the birthplace of what we understand as philosophy, not just back then, but even up to yeah. today. Yeah. All right? And, the, and the, I mean, if you're talking about philosophy, you have to talk about Socrates, you have to talk about Plato, you have to talk about Aristotle, okay? Socrates is like the father of philosophy, and a very interesting case, and I don't want to go down another rabbit hole, but I happen to believe that uh, he had an encounter with the living God, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Socrates' greatest student was Plato, mm -hmm. all right? Plato's greatest student, I hear the rolling thunder. Yes. Plato's greatest student was Aristotle, mm -hmm. okay? Do you have any clue who Aristotle's greatest student was? No. No. Alexander the Great. Ah. He was a tutor for Alexander the Great, wow. who conquered the world of his time. Right. So that's the philosophy, the concept. Why do you think Alexander's father, Philip, appointed a philosopher to train and teach him? Because philosophy is their, is, in a sense, it's their greatest god. All right. Philosophy, by the way, means a love of Sophia, wisdom. But it's a worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom. James talks about a wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it goes from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle, and then to, to Alexander the Great, who conquered the world. Well, mm -hmm. he didn't just conquer the world. You have to understand. I mean, it starts with him conquering the Persian Empire. So if you look at Daniel, in the statue, you see the transition, you know, from, the, from that Persian Empire, right? Right. But it then goes down to the Greek Empire. Mm -hmm. And that Greek Empire conquered Israel. Uh -huh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Before the Romans were in Israel, the Greeks were in Israel. Right. Now, what, what Greek influence was called was Hellenistic. Hmm. Okay, the Hellenistic Jews? Hellenistic Jews were typically, it's not just a matter that they weren't from Israel originally, it's that they were under Greek influence. Okay. Okay. Because Alexander, his influence and the influence of that philosophy carried all through 
the lands that he had conquered. And remember, even in the time of Jesus, while Rome is in control, the Roman Empire, even in Rome, Greek is still the lingua franca, the, the common language. All of the New Testament is written in Greek. Right. Okay? Right. They had, but those philosophers had an incredible influence on the early church that lasts to this day. Now, you know, I did studies in, in the graduate studies in theology, which God protected me from. Yeah. But I saw how much influence, yeah. particularly, you know, Plato and Aristotle had on the church that, that lasts and lingers to this day. Yeah. I want you to listen to something. That, uh, there was a theologian. He's, he's gone now, right? His name was Ralph, William Ralph Inge. He was a Church of England priest, a professor of divinity at Cambridge College, and dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London in the early 1900s, right? Okay. Okay. He, he, he's no slouch in terms of mm. theology, right? What he wrote was this. The Galilean gospel, as it proceeded from the lips of Jesus, was doubtless unaffected by Greek philosophy. In other words, he's saying Jesus was not affected by Greek philosophy. Right, right. But then he goes on to say, but early Christianity from its very beginning was formed by a confluence of Jewish and Hellenistic religious ideas. Wow. He's saying right from the very beginning, these Hellenistic, these Greek ideas, the philosophy began to have an influence on the church. Mm -hmm. All right, now if it didn't come from Jesus, and we just got through reading where it says that all knowledge and wisdom should come from him. Mm -hmm. If it came from Greece, hey, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think it's still a problem in Greece, check them out today. All right. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to ask you a question. And these are serious things, okay? What do you think was the single most powerful invention of Greek philosophy throughout all time? Powerful invention? Yeah, because, yeah, well, it is. It's an invention. Okay. Ideas can be inventions. Oh, okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer to that question is, we're talking about Greek philosophy that has had an effect on the world to today. Mm -hmm. It's called democracy. Democracy mm -hmm. is a Greek philosophy. Okay? Wow. Well, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's democracy, and everybody understands, I mean, anybody with any knowledge understands that Greece is the birthplace of democracy, okay? Well, but almost all Christians that I know in the Western world are certain that God created this form of power and rule called democracy. Mm -hmm. But it was actually an invention of one of the most pagan of empires here in Greece. It was one that would provoke Paul's spirit mm -hmm. years later with all its idolatry when he was in Athens, mm -hmm. all right? In the year 507 BC, the Athenian leader, Cleisthenes, introduced a system of political reforms that he called democratia. Mm -hmm. That is the Greek term for rule by the people. From the bottom up. That's where we're going, from the bottom up. Okay, it's the rule of the people, all right? This worldly wisdom, that's what it is, that yes, Greek philosophy, yes, yes, has is. become for many, even in the church, the ideal system. Hmm. Now you're going to know why I'm talking about Jeremiah, okay? okay. It's most, democracy is most strongly promoted in the world today by the United States of America a nation that was born in rebellion to the British king, George III, right? The founding documents of the United States of America is the Constitution, right? Or the Declaration of Independence. And it says this, government is inst governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Power comes from the bottom up, it says. Now, just as a clue, I'm going to give you a clue now. Recite as quick as you can in your head the, the, the prayer that we call the Our Father that Jesus taught. Thy kingdom. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
I hear the rolling thunder. Okay? All of the power, all authority, all of the glory belongs to the Lord. Amen. And Jesus, standing before Pontius Pilate, made it clear. All authority comes from the top down. All right. I'm going to read something again. This is from CNN back in 2005, in January of 2005. That was at the time of the second inaugural address of George W. Bush. This is when he's, okay? Right. And the President of the United States said, President, this is a report from CNN, President Bush opened his second term Thursday with a promise to the people of the United States and the world, vowing to promote democracy both at home and abroad. It is, this is what he said, it is the policy of the United States to seek and support the growth of democratic governments, movements, and institutions in every nation and culture. The president pledged to continue efforts to spread democracy throughout the world. Now let's go on to the president who's there today, President Barack Hussein Obama, right? He was in Ghana, Africa not long ago. This is back in 2009, actually. I'm just going to give you an excerpt of what he said to them in Ghana. You have the power to hold your leaders accountable and to build institutions that serve the people. You can make change from the bottom up. You can do that. Yes, you can. Because in this moment, history is on the move. Democracy is the rule of many over the few, where authority flows from the bottom up. Does it originate with God? That should be clear if you know the scriptures. It does not. Then where would it originate? Why would, why would Satan want to see this happen? Why would he want to see power and authority come from the bottom up? Because you can't get more bottom than him. That's right. In the pits of hell. You can't get more bottom than Satan. That's why he wants authority to come from the bottom up. All right? And again, <clears throat> Jesus said authority always flows from the top down. Mm. Now, he said that his word is what we'll judge at the last day. Okay? Amen, that's right. Yeah. His word is what we'll... That's, we're all, we're all going to be judged by his by word. His word. Right. Okay? Remember what I said before. Christianity is simply an, a kingdom ruled absolutely by a dictator. Yes. The very great danger in democracy, that philosophy, that Greek philosophy... And you better come to understand that that's what it is. It's a Greek philosophy. The great danger is that with the liberty and the freedom that Christ so dearly purchased for us on the cross, mm -hmm. we will begin to think that we are in charge. You're not in charge. And I want to speak to anybody involved in formal ministry out there. And as I, you know, we've talked about every Christian has a ministry. If God gives you a ministry, you want to know something? He has not put you in charge. No. He will always be in charge. His word will always be the rule. Amen. Always, all right? It's like he may assign you to a task and give you, give you the ability to do that task, and then you are responsible for that task, but you have to do it as unto the Lord, led by the word of God. And not lean on your own understanding. Not lean on your own understanding. So you know what? You're not in charge. That's right. That's one of the big problems in the church today where the church is going off and askew. Mm -hmm. Let me just close that part by saying this. When you come to understand about democracy, right? The Word of God says this. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We are all going to be submitted to His authority. Yes. We are all subject to His authority now. And if you are doing something and it is not being led by His Word, you are in rebellion. And the Word of God says that rebellion is as witchcraft. There's a lot going on in the church today that we call good, but it's witchcraft. Mm. You need to think about something when you start to... When you start to seek and search for truth in God's Word, that there are things that are going on in the church that we're celebrating shouldn't be. that shouldn't be. Mm -mm. 
which is why God spoke over to, over to, through the prophet Isaiah <coughs> so long ago and said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Yeah. There is a lot that we're doing in the church today that we're calling good, and it's simply evil. Whatever's being done in the dark will be brought to the light. And, the do and God is revealing this. He's, you know, he's well, bringing it to the light. Yeah, I know, and I, I'm, I'm sure this will upset a lot of people. The fact that I'm saying democracy is not... We live in a we, where our citizenship is in heaven. That's what it says in Philippians 3.20, right. right? Okay, I, you know, I was born again. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Before, before I was saved, I was a warmonger. Yes, you were. <laughs> I, I absolutely was. Mm -hmm. And if that's the demonstration of patriotism, I was as patriotic as you can get. Yes, you were. But I was born again, born from above, with a new father and a new citizenship, a new kingdom. Yes. Our citizenship is in heaven, right? Um, I'm submitted to that. Yes. I am submitted to that. And it's not a democracy. It is not a democracy. It is a dictatorship. It's a theocracy. The thing is, it's a loving, yes. loving dictatorship. Dictator. What he speaks brings life. Yes. Remember Ramah. Ramah was a time mm. when the people came to Samuel, who was the judge. In other words, he was the one that God was speaking through. Mm. And they said, give us a king that we might be like the other nations. And God said, you want a king? You can have a king. But here's the way it will be. And it is like the other nations. All right? It's like the world. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he showed exactly what it would be like. And what he said it would be like, he spoke into, it was a curse mm -hmm. on everybody that rejects him from being king over them. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what he said to Samuel. Absolutely. He said, they have not rejected you they have rejected me as being king over them. God is a God of good order. There is a structure, and that structure is in the church of Jesus Christ. That authority flows from the Father to Jesus Christ. Moves into us, and, and give the Holy Spirit that has been placed within us gives us the power to live the fullness of life there, the abundance of life that is there. All right, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to go on. I, I ask you, please, if you're watching this, don't leave and, and mentally and spiritually walk away from this. Have a conversation with the Lord. That's right. Talk to Him about this. Think about it. Pray about it. I, I've always said, don't take my word for anything. Amen. Test Get everything out. that I say against the Word of God. Amen. All right? But Amen. we need to be prayerful about the life that we're living. Because Christianity today simply, by and large, does not look like Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe that and you haven't done this yet, go back, read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and, and see if that's what you see here in the church. And I don't say that for judgment. Hallelujah. I say it for encouragement. So, until our next meeting, I pray that God bless you use you for the glory of his name and draw each and every one of us closer to him that we might come closer to one another in jesus precious name well god bless you and goodbye until the next time we gather here electronically bye bye, bye. far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners